Now, this guy generates millions of dollars painting white lines at a parking lot. But how did he go from a college graduate with an idea to a multi-million dollar company? Well, that's why we're here to find out. When I started, I had like 500 bucks to my name. Yeah. Failures are required for you to grow in your business. Like and required, I, they're huh? required. Being a 21-year-old uh, losing $25,000, that's yeah. uh, not a fun place to be, that's for sure. In these moments of chaos, it's hustle and innovation that win. Guys, in just nine months, John scaled to 51 locations in the USA. You have to understand that there's different buying cycles in the, the B2B world versus the B2C. Mm -hmm. I would use 10% uh, of that deposit for materials, the other 5% to kind of roll and finance uh, uh, the business as I was building it up there. But I bootstrapped it all together. Whether the economy is good or whether the economy is bad, you just have to start. I need you to pay attention because it's not just one thing. All right, let's start this episode, John. A little bit about you, what kind of business you're in, and anything else you want to highlight. Hey, absolutely. Well, yeah, my name is John Evans. I'm founder and CEO of uh, Everline Coatings and Services. We're in the parking lot, line painting, and pavement maintenance business. So oh, everywhere out there has a parking lot, and so we make sure that uh, they get service through a variety of services for our property management and property owner clients. Gotcha. How long have you been in business? Uh, I've been in business for about 12 years now. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and you yeah. started out of? I uh, started out of Calgary, Alberta, Canada, out of my backyard, fresh wow. out of school. And, uh, you know, just uh, operated in a little alley. And we had uh, one, uh, you know, we had our first crew. We had one comfort there, and it was just the single couch, and then it got a wasp nest in it. So uh, <laughs> that was the, that was the beginnings. That was the, the very beginnings of it all. Yeah. And 12 years later, how many locations? Uh, we're at just under 100 locations uh, here awesome. right now. So it's uh, been, been a wild ride here, very exciting, and uh, growing very quickly across North America and beyond. Let's talk about your first uh, business because you financed it, right? Mm. When you got started. That's right. When I started uh, College Pro, I, I mean, I was 20 years old, so mm -hmm. I had like 500 bucks to my name. That right? was, was going to be the question is like, how do you finance businesses to get going? Yeah. So let's talk so, about so the 500. For, and yeah. You know, a lot of it was, it was a mix of things. So needed cash flow, I was able to go to, uh, to, to the bank and I was able to get a, a, a small line of credit just to get me going. And then I was able to go and buy a 1997 GMC Safari and that was uh, like 500 bucks. And, uh, and I went and got uh, some ladders and some rollers, things like that. And as I needed more equipment, what I would do is I would go and book jobs and I would request a 15% yeah. deposit. Mm -hmm. I would use 10% uh, of that deposit for materials, the other 5% to kind of roll and finance uh, uh, the business as I was building it up there. So the more I booked, the more cash flow I was able to generate. And so therefore, uh, uh, so I was able to have more flexibility. What do you say towards you know, investors, business owners getting into the business now with all the financing options? What would you recommend? Do they finance? Do they pay all cash if they're limited? What are the options oh, out there? It depends on everybody's individual situation. Of course, just with interest rates where they are today, it's getting more expensive to borrow, but it's not as bad as it used to be either. So it's mm -hmm. a balancing act. So it's not something, uh, not, not a good idea right now to avoid uh, getting debts uh, in, in, in all cases, but I think there should be a healthy mix of cash going into the business, but also, uh, you know, getting proper lines of credit for operating capital and then uh, leasing payments for equipment and things like that. Awesome. Guys, in just nine months, John scaled to 51 locations here in the USA. That's right, nine months. Stay glued to the screen so that you can discover the secrets behind the rapid growth that they've been experiencing and you can learn from it as well. So in the first year of starting College Pros, you lost 25000 mm -hmm. What mistakes led you to that loss? I mean, being a 21-year-old uh, losing $25,000, that's yeah. uh, not, a, not a fun place to be, that's for sure. It was a big moment for me, of course, because you know I went into starting College Pro thinking I you know, was going to knock it out of the park. I was going to mm -hmm. be, I've been a high performer in most things in my life. And uh, that was a, a significant lesson learned and it mm -hmm. was a required failure. So I hit my revenue targets, uh, but I underbid all of my projects. Mm -hmm. I hired all of my friends and I did not understand my financials and just didn't keep track of my expenses. And yeah, at the end of the day, when it all added up, I ended up about uh, $25,000 in the hole. So everybody got paid but yourself. Correct. Yeah, and that was a, a, lot of, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears to make it all happen, but it was a, a necessary lesson. 
So you started Everline right out of your backyard. Mm -hmm. What were some of the initial challenges you were faced with, John? And especially age, too. You were pretty young. Was that an obstacle? How did you overcome? Uh, oh, oh, well, I mean, the main challenge of even the idea of me operating in my backyard is I was yeah. bootstrapping like crazy, trying to, you know, uh, uh, make every dollar stretch as far as possible. But in terms of uh, in terms of my age, I mean, uh, yeah, I was 23 years old and 24 years old starting Everline. And, you know, there is certainly an element of credibility that you mm -hmm. really have to, you know, counteract with a lot of confidence, a lot of value building, and just, uh, just communication with your clients to make sure that uh, they understand this isn't just some kid not you know, doesn't know who, what he's talking about, right. that kind of thing. Can you think of an example of when you were having a conversation, when age came up and how, how you kind of overcame that? Oh, certainly. I think, uh, you know, sometimes they'll do uh, 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 walk arounds around malls with a bunch of different contractors. Oh, yeah. And I meet myself being the youngest one there, <laughs> but, uh, you know, with having more advanced products and techniques than some of the old guard, you mm -hmm. know, me being able to present things that are more environmentally friendly or do last longer, you know, there's going to be that older, gruffier contractor be like, that doesn't work. And it's like, he he doesn't know what he's talking about and and I'm like I know what I'm talking about so things like that occurred and uh, you know just eventually just letting the work speak for itself at the end of the day what did it cost you to start Everline when I first started it was all in about fifty five thousand dollars to, to get going so did, did you uh, finance all of that it, it, it was a cash. mix yeah it was a mix of cash it was a mix of some family money to, to help bolster the, the coffers and uh, and it was just a mix of all of those things can you break down the fifty five thousand how yeah, was it used yeah so Licenses, actually uh, about thirty thousand of it actually was for the initial license uh, wow. for the TBL really? durable yeah for the durable material that uh, that I got to become uh, uh, to have a differentiator in the market there, mm -hmm. in, the, in the lion striping business there. Uh, the rest of it was, uh, you know, I went and found uh, a cheap enclosed trailer, uh, you know, used uh, line painting equipment, as well as, uh, you know, a $700 truck, things like that. I bootstrapped it all together right You out don't of the need gate. anything fancy schmancy to start with, basically, when it comes to tools, right? That's right, yeah, I just bought it as I went, and then the more jobs I got, the money I made off of those jobs went into building out and expanding our capacity. When you started Everline, what at that point in time was the biggest fear? I think the, the biggest fear came from, you know, the, the unknown primarily is, you know, anybody gonna buy my services? I've mm -hmm. just invested in all this equipment and, and uh, developed all this know-how, and, uh, you know, am I coming into a market that's that's saturated? Am I, is it something that is, you know, I'm just gonna bounce off the, uh, the surface and, and not be able to make it in there? And so I think that having that healthy fear is good. I feel it makes you, try harder. Mm -hmm. What do you say to people who don't start a wonderful, great idea that they've had for a long time because of fear of failure? Um, I think uh, I would say to, to those who have those issues, just do it. I know it's much easier said than done, but it all begins with a single step. And uh, you know, if you you know if you fail initially right out of the gate, say somebody just says no to you, uh, and uh, you know you go back, you refine your message, and you uh, try again. I've yeah. been dying to ask you this question because we've interviewed Shark Tank folks as well. Yep. Dragon's Den is a Canadian version, right? The Canadian version. What was it like to, to show up, to be on that show? Uh, what impact did it have on your business? So it was an amazing experience being able to just refine just this impenetrable 30 second pitch right out of the gate, generate something that would be really interesting to, for viewers to watch. I said, listen, we're going to go out and paint some lines and have the dragons paint lines. And uh, when, we, when I walked down those steps, and they were all there right in front of me. Were you just, nervous? Uh, oh yeah, oh yeah, big time. But they try to trip you up. They're trying to make great TV, right? Yeah, and uh, yeah. they, they ask unfair questions, they ask silly questions. So there's definitely a demand for line painting. Absolutely. So then what do you need John for? Uh, Why are you paying him franchise fees? They're trying to poke holes. They're trying to create drama. And that was something uh, for me is that we stood there uh, nice and strong and uh, took it all. You did and, well. ended, and ended up, uh, yeah, getting a deal on, on the on the den. I I want to offer you a deal. Uh, mm -hmm. I've decided to, uh, to, to work with Manjeet. Great. Oh, great. Looking forward to it. So why did you ultimately decide to leave College Pro and what were your next steps after that? So, uh, you know, having run that business for three years while in school, I more or less outgrew the program. I knew I wanted to continue running my own business there at that point. So mm -hmm. 
didn't really have any ideas uh, there at that time. And I went to uh, actually a franchise show to, uh, you know, one of those trade shows where a bunch of different franchises come up. And I uh, went and just checked it out and came across a uh, company that was not selling a franchise actually, but licensing a durable type of traffic marking product. Mm -hmm. It began the conversation looking in the pavement marking industry. Gotcha. So what sparked an interest specifically in the pavement out of all the options you had, I would assume there? The biggest thing for me is having come from a service-based uh, business, we started to understand that it was a lot like the painting industry that I was just in. So you could have went and did painting like you did before, right? I could have. You had that option. I, I could have. Interesting I, that you didn't build your own in that direction. That was certainly an option. I could have, and, but uh, I saw an opportunity and I decided to, to jump on it. Guys, thanks for submitting your questions. It's Blitz Time with John. First, Brian asks, what are some things you've implemented within your business to reduce client churn? We make sure that we check in with them throughout the year. It's not just when the uh, we are doing the work for them. Uh, they get a touch point at Christmas time, Thanksgiving, whatever. From Amari, how do you find commercial clients and what's the bidding process like? For the bidding process, uh, there's usually a tender process. You got to ask the commercial clients when are they performing their tenders for the year. So you just got to ask that. And then once, uh, then going and reaching out and finding them, it's uh, going through Zoom info lists, going through Google, LinkedIn, doing searches for property managers, operations managers. Old school stuff, okay. Um, do you have any regrets about this business? Actual Dream asks. No, not at all. Uh, uh, this has been, uh, been an exciting journey here. I mean, I think the regrets uh, would, would constitute failures and failures are required. Yeah. I forgot the peas. <laughs> How competitive is the market? Uh, it, it varies in location to location. However, the industry is loaded and as always has been loaded with mom and pop, uh, uh, lower sophisticated competitors. We are different than them. So there's not that many competitors at our level. Worst part about being an entrepreneur? The worst part about being an entrepreneur is you are always on. Okay. You are always on. Thank you guys. That's yeah. it for Blitz. <laughs> all right. So this is obviously the bread and butter of your business. Absolutely. Because these little thingamajigs are all over your shop yep. and everything. So talk to us about what the machine is called, what it costs, and the build of it. So this is a, a Graco Line Laser uh, 3900 size machine. This is the, the bulk of our fleet, we'll mm -hmm. say. This is our, our racehorse. I've built, uh, built an empire off these things. <laughs> so all this is is an airless sprayer that you can even rent at Home Depot that people often use for spraying their fence. Mm -hmm. Uh, attached to an engine for power and just on wheels to, to walk straight, uh, pull the trigger on a gun that sprays a four inch line out of it. Okay. And uh, you got a bucket here that's just sitting freely, right? You can literally just take it out. That's yeah. right. You got a bucket out of there. This is where you put the paint. The paint goes in here yep. and then you're able to, uh, yeah, that sucks up the paint into the hose here. You build pressure and then we attach the actual gun itself to, uh, to the holster. And when you pull the trigger, it pulls yeah. the trigger on the gun itself. Uh, what's <laughs> gun, the cost of these things? Uh, these are about between 9,000 to 12,000. You can lease them through various leasing companies, or you can even just get a typical equipment line out of there and it's secured against the equipment. So getting uh, financing on the equipment is not too bad at all. What are some methods and ways for a new business owner with little to no capital to market what are some strategies? Well, hey, I just want to first say I love guerrilla marketing. I'm a, I'm a bootstrapper at heart, and that is uh, uh, really the, the most gritty way to truly uh, get your business up and going. I love it. Uh, it lets you really understand at the ground level how your service is being perceived and mm -hmm. how you're, uh, you know, how you're presenting yourself, and, and you know, you're going to refine the the whole uh, message along the way. It's like a critical rite of passage, and mm -hmm. it's something that a lot of business owners. So I think for the viewers here, if you aren't going through uh, the any sort of guerrilla marketing as you're starting off your concept, it's really important to, uh, uh, to to really mention that it is hard work, it is really tedious, but it is so worth it because it builds the uh, uh, just the, the core elements of, of your business there. So, I mean, for me in College Pro, was it, it was simply knocking on doors. That's it. That was it. I would uh, you know go and I would precede the uh, the neighborhood. I would put down uh, put out signs at the entrances uh, to uh, just little wire cheap wire signs at the entrances to the neighborhoods that I would begin to market. It. Then I would uh, go and put down what we call door knockers, so just little flyers that hang off of the doors. And then in that same week, within the right time frame, uh, I would I actually hired a bunch of just students, and uh, I would uh, drop them off. And then they would each on each side, they'd go door knocking each down uh, each road, and then they would say, "Hey, my, you know, my name is you know George from College right. Pro Painters. We uh, we're in the area uh, painting houses. We'd love to provide you a free free quote." And uh, that was a, um, you know, a real key cornerstone to us building out uh, uh, operational capacity, sales capacity, and growing up from there. Have you ever 
lost faith in yourself, your business. Talk to us about the lowest point you've had to go through as an entrepreneur up to this point. I've gone through what I would say most, if not all, entrepreneurs have gone through, and it's called the entrepreneurial transition curve. So when you start mm-hmm. off a brand new venture business, something like that, right? You're excited. You you don't. It's based on you know just the idea of some sort of excitement piece, and uh, that's what we call uninformed optimism. Mm-hmm. So when I very first started Everline, I thought this is going to be something. You know, I'm you're going to make it big and paint every parking lot out there, and whatnot. Then you start making calls and you hear no. No, Mm -hmm. no. And then you move to the next stage, which is called informed pessimism. You're saying this is not nearly as uh, as easy as this as I thought it would be. This is I'm getting some resistance here. Self talk, right? Exactly, yeah. right? You're you're saying that's yourself, and then at, after that you get to what you call a crisis of meeting, and that's the low point. And I've been there countless times. Sometimes it happens on the level of of on a monthly basis, sometimes an hourly basis, things like that. Okay. It depends on the issue. And then once you get to that crisis of meeting, you have a decision as an entrepreneur. You can decide to crash and burn and you know you just say this is too hard I'm not going to learn from the lessons that brought me here or you gather up uh, you know you, you pull up the bootstraps and you uh, either reach out for support solve the issue that's uh, that's coming at you and you launch into what you call informed optimism mm. so this is something uh, or hopeful realism is also what it's called now you've you've come across an obstacle You've reached the bottom and you've decided you're going to get over it. You are aware of that obstacle. You now solved it and now you have uh, grown as a result of that. So, I mean, I've had so many instances of that, uh, you know, imposter syndrome. You've had, uh, you know, self-doubt. And uh, yeah, it's just uh, understanding that this is actually a very normal part of the entrepreneurial process. What are the differences between B2B marketing and marketing directly to consumers? You have to understand that there's different buying cycles in the, the B2B world versus the B2C. B2C being, hey, I need my house cleaned. I need uh, you know my fence uh, repaired. I need this or that or, or whatnot. And usually it's a one-off. It's very transactional. B2B, it's oftentimes for a lot of businesses, it's a, a repeat service. You are gonna be having a much deeper relationship with the with the vendor, the contractor, whoever. Mm-hmm. And, uh, we found that uh, really it is the long game in the B2B world, but it does generate greater results in the long term once you've established that relationship. B2B, because it is relationship based, you are finding who the decision maker is for your product or service that you're selling and you need to be able to to get to them directly. So uh, the way that we do it, uh, we find it, we spend a painstaking amount of time finding out who the actual decision maker is for, in our case at Everline, the property manager who's in charge of their pavements and line painting uh, services. Gotcha. Any tips, tricks, just little quick ones? Uh, I would say- through to the decision uh, uh, absolutely. Uh, persistence and tenacity. Uh, okay. There are going to be yeah. all sorts of gatekeepers. You got to find little creative ways to get around it. And you know, saying, "Hey, I had an appointment with the person in charge of uh, uh, of the parking lot." And one example that I've used in the past, where uh, you know, I said, uh, went up to um, uh, to an administrative office uh, at a mall, and I said. Oh, I, I had a, a meeting with the guy who's in charge of the parking Sneaky. lots, and uh, he <laughs> told me to send him an email, and I totally lost his business card and forget his name. Can I get it? And then they'll give it to you. So it's uh, little things like that that uh, uh, that get you there, and you have to. Otherwise, the whole system is designed to gatekeep you in the B two B marketing world. Gotcha. And so this is uh, a thing, things like that have helped us. Who handles the marketing at Everline? Is it corporate level? Is it a franchise level? Is it a mix of both? Help us understand that. It's a mix of both. So where the meat and potatoes of the, the, the Everline business success comes from for the individual franchisees are building local relationships. That local strip Absolutely. mall down the street, those churches, you know, the local library, what have you. Really nothing will, will replace a local service provider building out those relationships. Mm-hmm. But on the flip side, there are larger national accounts as well that we actually focus on as as corporate to uh, go after and uh, secure national accounts to be in order to parachute free work into our franchisees' territories. That's awesome. So, so you- major retailers, uh, uh, you know, just just really large uh, properties. We service 12,000 locations right now. The franchisor-franchisee relationship, it's based on that. The franchisor cannot be successful Good. without a successful franchisee, and we are hyper-focused on that. 2020 hit, a lot of businesses had to shift, adapt, unfortunately many closed. What was it like for you? And, and how many years at this point are you in business? I, I'd been in business for eight years. So we were rocking and rolling. We had just aired on Dragon's Den at that point. 
Hey there, Dragons. My name is John Evans. I'm from Calgary, Alberta. My company is Everline Coatings and Services. So we had uh, doubled in size across Canada and right, wow. uh, you know, at that moment, we had aired in November 2019 and everyone is getting trained right in the middle of March 2020. So I had a problem on my hands. Yes. I had, uh, you know, a whole bunch of brand new business owners uh, in, in wow. the Everline uh, business as well as a whole bunch of existing businesses. And of course, uh, our uh, franchisees, our clients, they were all shut down. So no one's paying them rent. Who's going to pay us and that sort of thing. So I was actually getting a lot of flashbacks from my time in starting up but with College Pro, I started it in the 2008 uh, uh, financial crisis, oh, wow. right in the middle okay. of that. And so just getting you know PTSD flashbacks to that where it was a lot of uh, just uh, in these moments of chaos, it's hustle and innovation that win. Because uh, if the pie is gonna shrink, if the market's gonna shrink, how do you get more of that pie? And so it forced us to look internally and see how we can better service our clients. And we decided to do that through technology adjustments to make it much more efficient so that for every lead that came in, that new lead was way more precious than it used to be in a chaotic environment. And we needed to make sure that we were maximizing it as much as so possible. So the practical step was implementing technologies that you haven't prior to that moment. So that actually had us implement the EOS system, the entrepreneurial operating system into our business. It's a uh, comes out of a book called Traction by Gina Wickman. Okay, we'll uh, that, is, that, out. Yeah, that is absolutely critical to navigate through the pandemic as well as our uh, uh, recent growth as a company. Because what it does is that it forces you to capture every single little issue mm. that comes out, out of your business. Very and it doesn't leave your system until it's solved one way or another. Economic times. Do I start the business now? Do I wait? Let's just hone in on that a little bit. What do you say? I think that if you have the idea to start, you can't just time the market. You mm -hmm. just have to start. Whether the economy is good or whether the economy is bad or even somewhere in the middle. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I find that if you wait for good economic times to, uh, to start your business, you actually, now your business is uh, kind of thriving and growing in an environment where only things are good. So you have to ask yourself, will it continue to operate when things are bad? And I've seen, you know, many companies do that where they grow and thrive during booming times. And then when it becomes challenging, they are unable to deal with it and they significantly shrink or close down. Yeah. So I find that those companies that start off, particularly in tough economic times, that, that's the fire in which they were forged. They, they got awesome. to the point that they were able to thrive despite the challenges. So I know this isn't the only piece of equipment that I saw. We've got a couple pieces here. Why don't you guys come with us? 100%. Uh, talk to us about this tornado here. It uh, looks like a tornado. Uh, yeah, my absolutely. Guess. So uh, what this is is a walk-behind blower uh, uh, by uh, it's, a, it's a Billy Goat blower. So what, how this works is uh, when you need to seal coat a parking lot, you, there's often du fine dust, you know, leaves, debris, things like that on there. You need to get that off the parking lot mm -hmm. uh, in order to, uh, to, to for the coating to properly stick to the asphalt. So you just walk back and forth. You turn on the engine, and it just has a uh, a hurricane wind that will knock you over if you stand in front of it. Here we are. In a 300 mile tornado! He's absolutely wicked here! I am going to blown away! And you just walk back and forth. Uh, and it cleans off the uh, the surface What's there. What's the cost? Uh, these are around uh, uh, between three and five thousand, depending on the size. Okay. Yeah. And then this machine here, last but not least, I think that's really the third item that I've seen different from everything else, right? Oh, well, absolutely. Well, we have a, have a couple more, of course, uh, 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 heading over there, but this is what we call a, uh, a crack filling machine. So this is, for lack of a better term, a rolling barbecue or a barbecue on wheels. Can I open it? So uh, you should be able to, it might be locked can... shut. Yeah, oh, go for it. There you Ooh. go. So you'll All see the in there, this in is, there. yeah, that's melted tar. This is uh, uh, dead dinosaurs. So essentially, uh, whenever there's crack in a uh, cracks in asphalt, you clean it out with a crack fill cleaner, and then you heat up this material. This material right. in here becomes liquefied, and it melts then down you there. pull here, and then you open up the the trough, and then material goes and fills the crack as you walk uh, along it. Okay. Thank you for the equipment tour. Hey, yeah, no problem. Going into this industry, specifically going into the partnership with you, mm -hmm. what am I looking at as far as potential revenue? Mm -hmm and what is the profit margin for this industry that we shoot for? Absolutely, well, what we show in our franchise disclosure document is uh, performance of our main branch, the Calgary branch that I started off with. Uh, right now, it's sitting in uh, Canadian dollars at about $2.8 million in performance there last year in revenue at a 51% gross margin wow. uh, on that there. So now when you look at to the, the franchise system, I mean, we're still relatively top heavy with newer franchisees, but very excited that uh, just on 
on the Canadian side, we were looking at an average of about $970,000 in average franchisee revenue, uh, which is, again, this happening so quick has been uh, up and great because the average growth rate for franchisees has been about 84% year over wow. year as a result That's of that. That's incredible. Yeah. yeah. You so, can't speak to the U.S. ones, ones yet I because they haven't yet. been fully matured or They, they the haven't right been term. open for a full year yet, but, okay. uh, I mean, looking at, so, so far what I can tell you is that the, uh, the U.S. Uh, franchisees uh, cl average client size and average, uh, uh, I guess, a uh, job size mm -hmm. is significantly higher than what we've ever seen in Canada. Wow. So when they say everything's bigger in the States, Good we're news. living proof in that. Absolutely. Only 19% of you guys who are watching are subscribed. That's right. That means 81% of you are risking FOMO on our, on our next killer episode. All right, so with what we have lined up, you guys, trust me, you don't wanna miss our next guest. So why not hit that subscribe button and become an exclusive member of the 19 Percenter Club. So why are we at a church parking lot though? Talk to us about the significance of it. As we're getting our franchisees trained up, it's really critical that they get real world experience. Mm -hmm. And so as part of our training program at Everline, we actually go around and we find uh, church parking lots to donate our services to. Wow. Uh, and at the same time, we're getting the chance for franchisees to learn how to do line painting, infrared asphalt repair, crack filling, seal coating, whole variety of different services, all on a real parking lot that needs it. And we get a chance to give back at the same time. That's awesome. Has it always been churches? It has always been churches. We started off in Canada though, so sometimes uh, you know we'd be training in the middle of winter inside a shop and we make a fake parking lot in there, but nothing <laughs> beats the real thing. Does anybody say no? Because it's incredible, guys. This parking lot and this church campus is massive, and these guys are doing this job completely for free. So you any knows? Yeah, you'd be amazed at how hard it is to give away a free parking lot job. Uh, yeah, you know, you call people and they say, Hey, what's the catch? What's going on? And uh, no, but fortunately it's worked out for this group here, so okay. we're excited. What's the pro and con between buying a franchise and then starting your own business from scratch? What have you learned? I mean, I've done both, right? Yes. Uh, I've been, uh, been a franchisee and started Everline on, on my own. And I think, you know, starting with being a franchisee, it was a huge benefit to have a brand behind me, have all sorts of resources, processes in place, and a proven model already been established by others so that I don't have to reinvent the wheel uh, uh, to, to be able to, you know, generate a profit a lot quicker. Mm -hmm. And then the, the cons being, I, I mean, I, I'm biased but uh, the, the cons being that you have great ideas, things like that, but you know, for a franchise model to have been developed to the point where it's franchisable and it can be franchised, it's there is a certain way that has been proven to work. So if you're one to go and chase the, the next shiny thing, the next new, uh, uh, I guess, uh, uh, widget on how you think you can start your business or you yeah. wanna expand in a lot of different ways, being in a franchise might seem more restrictive, but it's kind of more or less guardrails because it's very likely that those elements have been tried already I see. And so then therefore it's uh, it's been weeded out of the process for a certain reason. So you give up control uh, in a lot of ways, don't you? Um, I or... mean, it, yes and no. So being in franchising, it's being in business for yourself, but not by yourself. So you gotcha. do I have like that. guidelines that you have to operate within. And I guess the, the lack of control piece of it uh, would be is that, you know, you can't go and change the logo if you want to, or, right. you know, promote the, you know, the services in a certain way. That's fine. And usually that's for a reason. It depends on what type of entrepreneur you are. If you're very entrepreneurial, uh, then starting your own business is going to be great. But of course, that comes with a greater risk versus right. those who, uh, you know, just are saying, "Hey, I want to run a business and apply a model that's already been proven to itself." Mm -hmm. Going the franchise route is uh, is the better option uh, because you've been a part of something that's been proven already. I'm sure we can talk a lot about that and more. So if you guys want to know more information, just follow through the proper channels. Look in the description below on how you can become a partner with Everline. So when things go wrong in business, what do you do specifically to not be overwhelmed, stay focused, and not be broken by all of it? Uh, I mean, I think the, the first thing is to not overreact, you know, assess what is the issue, what, mm -hmm. and then listing out the specific issues because once you're able to identify that, you're able to come up with some sort of solution. So then what is the best way to turn a failure in a business into a learning opportunity? First, it's the mindset you have to have that failures yeah. are required for you to grow in your business. Like required, and they're huh? required. If you pr try to prepare your business where just everything's gonna run perfectly through the entire time, you're, it's, you're never gonna launch, you, you gotta get out there. And I like to say, 
some fires have to burn. So for example, you know, you're on site all the time, you need to, you know, you, you need to be there because you want to make sure this job goes so perfect for your client, which is awesome, and your crews are still learning a little bit, but it's also, it's at the opportunity cost of you not being able to go and sell and, and uh, gen generate new business uh, right. uh, for, for your business. And uh, this mindset says like, okay, we're going to get the crew trained up appropriately. We're going to make sure that they get uh, out the door and that they know what they need to know. And if a mistake happens or a challenge happens, you know, having that proactive urgency to get jump on top of those fires and use that as a learning experience for the crew itself. You've sought mentorship a few years into Everline Coatings growth. Mm -hmm. Why did you seek that guidance and how did that help you continue to succeed? Well, mentorship I think is the critical elements uh, in the entrepreneurial journey because somebody is one step or several steps ahead of you in that journey. And uh, so I needed to go and find somebody who had done this before uh, so that I can kind of just get a heads up as to what's coming up around the corner for me at my stage of the business at that time. Can you help us understand your mindset at that moment when you're like, I need, I need someone to, to call because it's a few years into it. It mm. wasn't from the get-go, right? It was about a, a year and a half into it uh, where I realized I had missed that community and that collaboration mm. feel from the franchise system and being by myself and really having nobody to collaborate with, commiserate with, you mm -hmm. know, uh, have a shoulder to cry on or, uh, you know, uh, somebody to, uh, to, to cheer. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You need that. You do. You do. And uh, so, you know, it, luckily I had been exposed to that. So it was at this point where I was like, I have this ball of energy at Everline that is growing very quickly. Mm. I need to learn how to harness this properly. And I just, I had the self uh, understanding and realizing that I, I didn't have the experience at that point. I was 24 years old at the time. Your franchise is one of the fastest growing franchises in North America. Mm -hmm. What kind of chaos are we talking about when it comes to this kind of growth so quickly? I mean, nine months, 51 locations in North America. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of paperwork. That is a lot of people to deal with. Yes. Help us understand what you're going through during this season. So I expected to grow maybe at a rate of a one to three locations per month, which for a Good lot luck. of companies would be amazing, yeah. right? Uh, we were growing at a rate of about four to five a year in Canada. So that was a big, big difference. Interesting. And uh, for us, we had a corporate staff of three of us, and uh, we had this whole strategic plan that planned out if we were going to be growing one to three. Uh, uh, and then, you know, the first month, nine showed up, and then the next month 11, then eight franchisees showed up. And so this whole strategic plan we had, we had to dump it on the floor and uh, you know, all this strategic hiring, we needed to bring people in to be able to bolster our infrastructure to make sure the franchisees were very well trained and very well supported. So that was the number one piece mm -hmm. of it was to okay. get, get our infrastructure set up for that. The number two, of course, was uh, the, the back end support in the office uh, for buying and selling equipment, for, mm -hmm. for accounting and finance, things like that. That's incredible that you did it at such a quick pace uh, scaling too fast can shut a business down. Would you agree? A hundred percent. Growth can kill. It sounds awesome, mm -hmm. but living through it is a whole other thing. Even an exceptional company, John, cannot keep all their customers happy. Would you agree? A hundred percent. I mean, it happens. There's the human element. Uh, and so, and, and most clients do understand that, but really it's what matters is, and we call this the service recovery uh, paradox, right. is that when issues happen on site, uh, and uh, you know, say somebody's not happy with the work that was performed or the product that's been been served or what or whatnot. You know, in fact, the way that you react to that and take care of them in that moment actually builds out a greater, uh, I guess, a deeper relationship with those clients, especially in the B two B world. Mm -hmm. So in our instance, say a line that they painted, it's not the straightest. Uh, you know, you're somebody's learning and, uh, and and they're growing there, and you know, the client calls you and says, I want this line perfectly straight and this uh, this shouldn't have happened uh, agreeing and operating with what we call proactive urgency to take care of the client right. and when that occurs they will truly uh, uh, trust you a lot more and they're going to use you more you have some proprietary software and IT for your franchisees can you share what that looks like what is that uh, absolutely so we have a whole uh, technology tech stack uh, from cradle to grave and how uh, franchisees are able to manage their their marketing process in, in terms of that process prospecting of all those B2B clients, all the way to once those clients uh, say, hey, I would like a quote, we have a, pro a, a proprietary software that uh, uh, prices out everything for them. So you can call, you can count and say, hey, there's 100 lines, 10 stop bars, you know, 15 potholes to fill here, it pumps out, 
uh, what you should charge or what uh, what it's going to cost the franchisees. Uh, then even going to being able to present the uh, uh, the, uh, the the actual work itself to uh, uh, th via proposal yes. software and video software, mm -hmm. and then going into operations, scheduling and managing your crews and tracking your KPIs, your gross margins, how productive each one of your uh, staff are on site to find out who your most profitable employee is, mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. So all of those things come together for the franchisee. What are your top recommendations for books? I'm a big uh, autobiography and biography guy. Uh, okay. The Everything Store about Amazon. Uh, you have the Steve Jobs uh, uh, biography and then as well as mostly The Ride of a Lifetime, the story of Bob Iger, the CEO of Disney. I found that to be a remarkable story. And out of those books, what would be your biggest takeaway, would you say? You know, in the very beginning uh, chapter of Bob Iger's book, uh, th there was a situation where they were, it was a really happy day uh, that they were opening up Disney World China and you know, you're there to be uh, there to be happy. So CEO, he's there to be a figurehead. Yeah. And then on that exact same day, a child was killed on a park in Disney World for uh, by an alligator. And so he's dealing with the grieving family uh, of, of the child and trying to be, it's happy, it's happy. And yeah, it's like that those, weird. that's impossible. That's an impossible day situation. Mm -hmm. And just how we dealt with it and manage it, I found to be remarkable. Wow, thank you. If you're interested in a franchise business, make sure to check out episode 173 with Carmelo, who owns a $30 million a year home painting business. Take a second to like and subscribe, and we'll see you next time.